record button recording in progress um all right let me share my screen now right you should be able to see the slides Is that correct yes all right um so thanks actually today we're not going to talk about the most recent works because one shouldn't talk about stuff that's st still under review so we're gonna be talking instead about the the works um, of my recent past um broadly this talk will be looking as follows i'll be giving a brief introduction to self-supervised learning then we're going to talk about one paper which learns generalizable representations and in so doing labels a data set for free basically then we're going to talk um, briefly about privacy and the kinds of data sets we use in self-supervised learning then we're going to move into um, video data where we can do multimodal self-supervised learning where we can use video and audio for example for clustering or video audio or video text for learning really strong representations and lastly we're gonna go a bit off topic but i hope you'll see the connection as well where we're going to talk about bias in large-scale nlp models um here are some of the main collaborators of the works presented and the funding i had during my phd which i'm very thankful for and yeah as I said, I won't be talking about papers that are currently under review. All right, introduction to self-supervised learning. Now, we all know that the field of AI has made rapid progress thanks to the three ingredients of novel algorithms, better hardware, and large-scale data sets. And I would argue that the most important ingredient of those, the one that has actually made the other things possible, is the data. However, this data really is made up of two parts. First, the raw data, such as images and videos, which are ubiquitous. For example, every Tesla car records the surroundings, yielding massive amounts of data. But the second part are the annotations that basically tell the model what is what. For example, these could be labels per image, or even specifying exactly which pixels belong to, say, the road or to parking cars, as in the bottom row. This can require expert knowledge or even up to 30 minutes per image of drawing these very detailed maps. So the second side of this data coin is what really limits progress. It's expensive and uh, limits the amount of data that can be used. This in turn can lead to small and biased data sets and limited application areas of these models. Now in my research and self-supervised learning, I focused on solving this issue by developing methods that do not require these manual annotations. Now, why would we think that this could even work? Well, we know that there is information in the raw data alone. For example, even a baby can distinguish between a train and a bird well before it was told what the names of these objects are. So there is signal in the visual information alone, and it should be possible for a computer to extract this somehow and make sense of images. This means that we want the data to provide a supervisory signal, replacing the manual annotations. And this we call self-supervision. Let's take a deeper look into what we want to achieve. One of the main goals is to learn visual representations. That is, models that take some visual input, such as an image or a video, and yield a vector which retains important information, such that they are useful for a variety of other tasks. These tasks we usually refer to as being downstream, and having such a pre-trained representation allows you to learn much quicker using a lot less data. This has been shown for multiple tasks by now, such as few shot learning, classification, detection, segmentation, key point detection, and for videos, um, tasks like action recognition, sound localization, or video text retrieval, they all benefit from self-supervised pre-training. So, but why would we want to retrain the representations without labels? I mean, there are already large scale data sets with labels, right? Well, as I said, the biggest advantage is that we do not have to rely on this bottleneck of labeling, which might be good enough for now, but, um, in order, but if we don't require these, we can scale to the vast amount of data that is becoming available. So if we think 1 million or 2 million labeled data sets are large, think of the billion scale which becomes possible with self-supervised learning. But there are more benefits. A well pre-trained model allows one to use strong computer vision models, even when there's very little labels available. So this increases accessibility to this set of tools drastically. For example, if your botanist is trying to identify plants. <clears throat> Conducting research on what is possible 
to learn without labels is also a fundamental research effort. While I don't want to stretch similarities to the biological domain, we're definitely inspired by the experiments that show what can be learned without someone explicitly mentioning what object has what label. Finally, pre-training without labels avoids the ambiguity of labels, such as what even is a house, and combined with the scalability, allows for learning more inclusive and diverse models. Now, with this as our motivation, let us start with my first work. Um, in this work, we're going to talk about the self-supervised representation learning methods, which also yield pseudo labels for a data set for free. It's called self-labeling via simultaneous clustering and representation learning, and was presented at IKEA 2020 as a spotlight. Um, and in this work, we introduce a novel loss that can be used for both clustering and representation learning, and is currently in a slightly modified version used by Facebook's SWARF model and also the Dino model. Now, the motivation for this paper comes from our initial idea of just trying to get rid of labels. Why can't we just learn the labels ourselves? So here, we start with a data set of images. Well, not this, but this. Well, this times 50, that's 1.2 million images. That's the size of ImageNet, the default data set we all use. Um, and we can immediately see why manual annotation can get expensive. And now we want to get from here to here. That is, we want to discover visual concepts without using annotations. Now with this goal set, we need to figure out the how. Note that this is quite a chicken and egg problem. If we have a good model or a good chicken, it's easy to get good labels, eggs, and vice versa, but it's not immediately obvious where to start. For this, let's take a step back and think about what is required to understand an image. One necessity for image understanding is separating meaning from appearance. For us humans, this is easy. We see a picture of a tree. However, the CNN sees just pixel intensity values. The model doesn't have any way to know what is important initially. For example, the overall shape of the foreground object versus what is not important. But what if we had different lighting conditions? Say the sun was actually shining. The pixel values would change drastically, but the meaning has not changed. The same goes for mirroring the image or using a different zoom level or other augmentations where the meaning doesn't change when we apply them to an image. Now, the fact that the meaning of an image does not change with these augmentations means that we can use this as a free learning signal to tell the computer to differentiate between what is important and what is not. This idea sits at the core of our work. Here, I will give you first the broad intuition. We start by assigning each image a label randomly. For example, this image gets assigned label A and this image label B. Now, we transform our images like these augmentations and ask our model to predict which label this image belongs to. And if it gets it wrong, like it does here, we optimize the assignments of these labels such that they are consistent when one transforms the image. This way we can say that image A belongs to image one belongs to image uh, to label A and image two belongs to label B. Now, technically what made this possible is combining three ingredients that hadn't been combined before. I will not go too much into the details, but what we do is the following. We change the standard loss function that we use when we have labels Y, here depicted on the left, to work when we don't have labels. On the left, L is the loss, P is the softmax output for a given network phi, and input image X. Now, for doing this without labels, we need these three ingredients, namely the usage of an assignment table that makes the label soft and optimizable. But with this alone, we can still fall prey to trivial solutions where all the labels are set to be the same and the loss is minimized. So second, we enforce equipartitioning of the labels. Now, this is effectively a regularization. And finally, we pose and solve this problem as an optimal transport problem. This makes this objective fast to solve on a GPU and apart from a regularization term is actually identical to the cross entropy term we use to train the CNN. Now, the algorithm itself is a kind of expectation maximization algorithm, where we first generate our labels from a random network and then train the network with those labels. And with that, we've also solved the age-old mystery. It's a chicken that comes first, or more accurately, and a randomly initialized chicken. 
Let's take a look at a few examples. When we apply our method on ImageNet, it has, for example, discovered this concept. This box shows what images we have grouped together without having access to any of the human annotations. Here, the concept it has found is that of a geezer. Similarly, for this concept, a zebra, a monarch butterfly, and a ball of hay. Now, since ImageNet does have manual annotations, we can compare against it. For this, we draw the border color of each image in a color representing this manual annotation. We find that we are in fact quite close to this without having used any of these expensive annotations. Now, even the clusters which are not as pure in terms of ImageNet clusters are easy to make sense of. And a NeurIPS paper from our lab actually uses uh, these annotations to analyze the clusters in more detail. And you can explore all clusters without cherry picking, without sorting, just by clicking through them on our web page. Besides these clusters, we can also analyze the representations quant quantitatively. Um, as I said, the representations as an input, uh, as a black box where you give in an image and get a vector out. Here we look at the network that was obtained and keep its parameters fixed. Then at various conf layers, so at various depths of the network, we just add a linear layer to predict, predict the image net classes. This is called linear probing and a common way to evaluate representations. Now, the back, of, back then state-of-the-art numbers achieved performances of around 40%. Using the same augmentations and training schedules, we can achieve 47%, and this is for an AlexNet, and by combining this with distilling self-labels of a better model and another proxy loss, we can even achieve 50%. For this task, we were still behind supervised learning. Back then, it was 2019. But already at that point for Pascal VOC detection, which is another downstream task, we were outperforming supervised um, pre-training, as we show in the paper. Now, that was 2019. And I remember our paper came out one day before Moco V1 came out on Archive. Um, and Moco V1 had better numbers. But despite that, it's, it was actually the augmentations which made the biggest difference. And um, our method is still relevant. It's an, and it's important to see what influence it has had. The then quite long state-of-the-art Suave from Facebook uses our Syncon Knop algorithm and found that Sailor plus the new augmentations that were implemented in Moco actually work really well. And so basically they, they yeah, we achieve 71% um, ImageNet top one accuracy. Furthermore, in the current state of the art Dino, which uh, uses vision transformers now, they also show that Syncon Knop um, achieves pretty much the same performance as the new method. And centering is basically an easier proxy for the same procedure, which um, means that even though our method per se is, is now not state of the art anymore, it lives on as a main engine in these, in these newer methods. So from this paper, let us take three conclusions. Augmentations can make something seemingly impossible happen to generate decent labels when starting from just a random initialization. Secondly, we find that the labels are close to the ground truth and are useful for interpretation and also distillation purposes. Thirdly, our new Syncon Knopf plus Crunch Entropy Loss is an efficient solution for self-supervised learning and is used in current state-of-the-art methods. Now, in the next, in the paper just now we've talked about a cool new algorithm but algorithms alone is really only the recipe for a cake you still need the ingredients which is the training data data which we're going to dive into here this paper called pass an image net replacement for self-supervised pre-training without humans has been presented at neurips this year at the data sets and benchmark track now the self-supervised learning community has moved forward by innovating on algorithms, but always keeping the same pre-training data set, which was ImageNet 12 for training. But actually, if you think about it, this choice is very odd. ImageNet itself, in the variant that we all use, has 1.2 million images and 1 million classes, and it contains more than 120 dog classes, which is quite specific. Um, and it's also curated, so all the classes occur equally often, roughly. It's created from WordNet, a word hierarchy, despite that in ImageNet 12, the different hierarchical levels are completely flattened and they aren't even used. It's created by using search engines, which are prone to return very simple and clear examples back. And that's why ImageNet um, people describe this or people have shown that it's very object-centric. 
well, these can be po posed as technical quirks, which probably make the model generalize less. Um, that's not crazy bad. But recently, there's been some more problematic and more new, new, newer research. For example, from Crawford and Paglen, they have investigated the full ImageNet hierarchy and found many problematic images of humans, which actually has had huge impact and has led to the complete removal of the person subtree of ImageNet in the big uh, ImageNet 21K. Then in 2020, uh, the audit from Birhana and Prabhu found many problematic images, even in this 2012 split, which we all use. For example, classes which are heavily skewed towards one gender and contain a high percentage of potentially not safe for work pictures for which no consent was obtained. Furthermore, within object classes, a large bias can be seen. For example, the harp class only appears with female people in the data set, while the saxophone, for some reason, only with males, um, which means the data is biased, which can and will likely, of course, affect the resulting models that you train with them. So let me summarize the current state or thinking of self-supervised learning versus ImageNet as a data set. Self-supervised learning, the idea is that we can scale to billions of images because we don't need labels, we don't need curation. It can learn generic representations, which are just general, just like our eye can immediately detect and see objects. And it should also not uh, require customization for any training data set you use. However, the current state status quo of ImageNet before our paper came out was that everyone uses ImageNet, even though labeling is expensive, it doesn't scale. Um, Inter-rater agreement is tricky. For example, if two raters say it's this label and a third one says it's this label, which one do you actually take? It's an object-centric data set, which is very specific. And in fact, people have tuned augmentations, learning rates, weight decay schedules, all of these things, and then evaluate it on the same ImageNet data set, which is weird. Why would you use a data set without labels if you're then going to use the labels, basically? So we were at this state um, for self supervised learning and ImageNet. So we thought, how can we solve this? So what did we do? We removed all the humans in the pre training set. We removed them not because we don't care about them, but because of the opposite, because we want a data set that is safe and legal and as unbiased as possible. Having humans in the data set is just too, too difficult for debiasing, as we don't know the confounders, we don't know how this could be done in a systematic and safe way. Now, one potential question you might be thinking is, why do we think we can just remove humans? Doesn't the method suffer? Well, remember, we're doing self-supervised visual representation pre-training. Why would, we, why would you need them for just learning to see or detect patterns, which is what self-supervised learning is doing? For learning generic features, having various objects and augmentations is important and enough. And even in ImageNet, people just appear somewhere in the background, say holding a fish or somewhere in the background. It's not, they're not the main subject of this data set. So we already know that um, they, they aren't hugely important. And if we have a downstream task that involves humans, we can just fine tune the network. And spoiler alert, we show that this is exactly the case. Even on downstream tasks that involve humans, we can just fine tune and it works as well as with ImageNet. How do we get to this data set? Well, we start from a previously published data set, YFC 100 million, which contains 99 million images with Creative Commons licenses. We take the images which have the most um, generous license, the CCBY license, we download and remove um, broken files, and we remove, we first filter the images by automated methods that detect faces and people, which works really well, which left us at around 6 million images. And then we further balance the image contributions by user. So the metadata we use is user, um, username or creator name, which you actually need to have in order to properly attribute each image. So if you have an image, you need to attribute need to say from whom the image is. So we have that information and we use this for balancing. So this actually does not, this is, you can call it unsupervised curation because we don't need any human to go through it or any other thing. Um, and in this way, we achieve a data set which has less than 80 images per user so that not a single user is dominating the whole data set, for example, full license files, 1.4 million images, and we further verify with human uh, annotators that there is in, indeed no humans. 
Um, in more detail, actually, we don't just remove all the images of humans, we also remove body parts and personal information um, in line with um, what we think is a, is a way that GDPR is intended, basically. Um, if we take a look at real data, for example, these images, um, there's one image here that has been removed by the annotators. It's pretty tricky to find. And yeah, it's this one. There's a hand in there. So we were we were really thorough in this and um, tried to be as detailed as possible such that we get a safety data set. We've also removed duplicates with common downstream data sets such as Coco, Pascal, ImageNet, and Places. Now we can take a look at the data set and we find that it's it's containing uh, lots of nature, buildings, um, and all sorts of things. Of course, no humans. Um, and we can take a look at the metadata, which is also in the YFCC metadata file. And we can find that while it's definitely uh, like worldwide, it's still, of course, biased to Northern Europe and Northern America. Um, and so we cannot say our data set is fully unbiased, of course not. Um, and this is one plot that shows this. Here we show the number of images per creator. As you see, uh, as I mentioned, it's the highest value you get is 80 images per creator. Here are a couple of images. Um, this should be a GIF, yes. And it looks almost like there is humans in there, but there is none. And it's quite amazing what kind of diversity you can get even on images without humans. And there are statues, there are uh, some paintings, for example, of humans, um, but there is no, not a single real human in this data set, or at least if you find one, let us know. All right, so our main task now is how does it perform when you run self-supervised learning methods on this? So we ran a whole battery of tests and um, these range from extremely frozen model evaluation where you just take the representations and run k-means to all the way to full fine tuning and notably full fine tuning for tasks such as dense pose estimation, where it's all about humans. We compared against places and ImageNet 1K, that's the default ImageNet pre-training. What we found is that broadly, let me show all of these, um, we win some, we lose some against ImageNet, but are overall on par. So everywhere where you can see two arrows, we surpass ImageNet and places pre-training under the same settings using a MoCo v2 self-supervised learning method. Um, everywhere where we have one arrow, we surpass places, uh, which is everywhere, actually. So we're definitely consistently better than places pre-training. On some data sets, we're better than ImageNet. On some data sets, we're slightly worse or on par with ImageNet. For full fine-tuning, we find that even on tasks which require humans, we achieve around the same performance as ImageNet, which is dense pose and key point estimation. And even key point estimation, we only used 5% of the labeled training data set. So even if you take just a very small subset of images with humans, it can learn to, to fine tune the representations that it already had, which had no idea about humans, to properly detect human key points. So this is kind of the summary. Um, as I said, we have a process which can scale to billions of images. The, our data set is likely a better indicator because it's random images that are not curated, not object-centric. And we still learn very generic visual representations without having humans in our data set, thus minimizing risk. Please visit our webpage where you can find the download links. So far, we've uh, counted more than 700 downloads, and it's also included in TensorFlow data sets. Right, so let's move on to video data now. The world isn't images, and the vast majority of bits and bytes in the internet isn't either. It's, it's videos, and they contain a lot more to learn from. Now, remember this slide. Here, augmentations gave us crucial insights into disentangling meaning from appearance. I will show you how different modalities like audio and video can do the same. For multiple now, multiple modalities, such as video and audio, are interesting, not just because it's more data, but it's actually better data. It's both redundant and complementary. Let me show you. For example, take these two images. They look very different, even though they depict the same action. It would be hard for an untrained model to infer similarity without labels. However, when we have another modality, for example, the audio, I hope this wasn't too loud. And this audio, 
it's much easier to see that these two pictures have a similar meaning. Similarly, we can use similar visuals to associate very different audios and, also, and use this as supervision. In this case, a classic piano piece and some very different keyboard sounds. Hence, we can use multiple associated modalities to obtain learning signals. With this set, let's tackle the task of unsupervised clustering. Why unsupervised clustering? Well, we've seen significant progress in the image domain for clustering. However, this has been lacking in the video domain, where even though videos are even more expensive to annotate. And fundamentally, video content is rapidly increasing. Think of TikTok, uh, Snapchat, and uh, Instagram Reels, accelerating the need to work on this problem. And actually, videos is also what, for example, Tesla cars record. So videos are really important. Um, so we thought, basically, let's do this. Um, let's tackle this problem using this idea. But how does one go about this? Well, the one variant is to just cluster two modalities separately. But of course, this does not use this same source information that we were talking about. And in the end, you get two different sets of clusters. So this isn't great. Another solution which has been done previously is to do cross-modal training. This gives you two different sets of clusters and it's really hard to interpret. For example, the labels you get from, from uh, two, they are obtained from the audio modality, but they were trained in a cross-modal manner and they're not the same as labels one, so it's really tricky. And this works well for representation learning, but not for clustering. Um, you can concatenate, then you get just get one set of labels out, sure. But actually, as we also showed empirically, concatenation can just rely on the stronger modality and ignore the other. Instead, what we do is the following. For example, we take a look at this modality, the audio, and maybe you can guess what kind of action this was. Yep. Um, and if we show the video now, Yes, so you can see that these two are redundant. Um, and so what we, how we treat these different modalities as augmentations of one another. And not augmentations in the typical sense, but more of a high level augmentations where they depict the same meaning. So we want them uh, to be yielding the same labels and it doesn't matter which one you take basically. So we, to require single modal, single multimodal labeling, what we want is that both modality specific encoder, Psi A and Psi B, to predict the same cluster ID, which is shown here. Next, in order to view modalities as augmentations, we, we utilize the synchron knob clustering that I described earlier and compute averages over the log probabilities of both networks. We also add a simple fix that allows us to take care of non-uniform distributions like Gaussians or heavy tail cluster distributions like ZIP, which are more important for applying this method in the wild. Our final framework is really simple and combines these two ideas. Here, we show that good representations don't necessarily lead to good clustering. We show NMI, which measures how well a certain clustering against the ground truth is for various SSL methods. For example, MILNCE, the red bar, obtains really strong features and actually obtains stronger features than our method. But if you look at the clustering performance, it's much worse. So, or even the supervised method um, actually underperforms our method, which learns to simultaneously cluster and represent audiovisual data. We find the same trend on another data set too. Hence, if you care about the clusters, don't just take a pre-trained model and run k-means, at least not for video, what we show here. In our NeurIPS paper, we've leveraged this insight to find concepts in a large-scale data set of a quarter million videos with audio. And indeed, we find that we can discover concepts such as this, playing of a harp, or these. And the name is what I just gave them um, for, for interpretation. They are, of course, called pseudo-cluster 1, pseudo-cluster 2, etc. Now, to further research and reproducibility, we've made all the source code for this paper available. And you can also go through the browser and click through all the clusters that we have found. So you can see what our class, our model things belong together. All right, next we're gonna talk about a very generic framework for multimodal contrast learning, which you might know as GDT. Um, we introduced GDT 
which are generalized data transformations, which give you control over which transformations you want to learn invariance and distinctiveness against. This framework allows you to do the following. It allows you to reduce most existing pretext tasks to noise contrastive formulations. It allows you to explore and test novel pretext tasks, especially in the multimodal setting. And it, it gives you rules on how to combine these pretext combinations. Now, what is a GDT? A generalized data transformation is a mapping acting on a set of training samples to produce a new sample. We use a hierarchical sampling scheme to generate general data transformations for a batch. I'll show you one way to create such a transformation here. First, we sample MI transformations that slice the data set to yield MI data points, in this case, videos. Then for each sample data points, we can sample two starting teams, for example, in the video. For each index and starting point, we can then project the video into its oral and visual components, done here, video and audio. And lastly, we can apply spatial and oral augmentations, such as random cropping or random volume increases. Therefore, a GDT is constructed as a sequence of M transformations, TM. From the data transformations in a batch, we can specify different learning hypotheses. For example, we can learn a representation that is distinctive to sample and time shift, but invariant to modality, as you can see in the heading. This function learns to A, pull together embeddings from video and audio clip at the same time from the same video. But it pushes apart embeddings for different temporal segments from the same video, which is, kind of, for example, had been done in the AVTS paper by Korba et al. It also pushes apart embeddings from different videos, which is similar to the, or which is a contrastive paradigm. One main motivation for this particular example is that intuitively, the semantic content of a video might, do, might be different at different starting points. So it is necessary to force representations to be distinctive to such signals. And lastly, importantly, we compare transformations cross-modally, meaning that we compare transformations across different modalities such as audio and video. This forces the network to learn higher level semantics and this is a method where we care about the representations, not about the lab, not about the clusters. There is no clustering in this work. It's contrastive learning. In this paper, we can use this uh, framework to learn invariances and variances, all in a unified contrastive manner. For example, these two clips, they're roughly the same content, but in the left clip, a man is walking in a forward direction, while in the right, the clip is reversed so that, that he's walking backward. Should we enforce variance or invariance to time reversal to learn the best semantic representation? So using our framework, we can answer this question empirically. In this paper, we explore three main learning hypotheses that can be constructed from video data. Sample distinctiveness. This is a classic one for contrastive learning. Um, note that you can also add augmentations for images, all the augmentations. Um, time reversal, as I've just shown you, as well as time shift where you just take a different starting time. And once again, we look at these transformations cross-modally and we test both learning invariance and distinctiveness. Here we show the results of using, our, of using our GDT framework for composing transformations for audiovisual representation learning. For the time shift transformation, we see gains from being distinctive rather than invariant to the transformation, reaffirming similar results found in other audiovisual representation learning works such as AVTS. For time shift, uh, the model profits from having to differentiate different points in time. For example, between an athlete running versus an athlete landing in a sand pit, which could be both in the same video. This intuitively serves as a hard negative for the model, increasing its discriminative power. For time reversal, we see that invariance is a better learning signal. Many actions depicted such as moving an object are inherently invariant to reverse in time therefore yielding a gain when used as an augmentation for this data set. To get a we get a further boot boost by composing these two transformations, showing that empirical and practical benefits of our GDT framework. With our framework, we are able to achieve state-of-the-art performance on both video action retrieval and few shot classification. We outperform the state-of-the-art by over 7%, 7 points recall at one, on the UCF retrieval task. And we see similar performance on one-shot classification on UCF. When our representation is fine-tuned as it was standard um, for video action representation, 
uh, downstream task, we set a new state of the art among all audiovisual self-supervised methods on, on benchmarks such as UCF and HMDB1. Um, oh, and here's a newer number from XTC. So we are close, but not quite. Um, on on uh, what is it, UCF? Yeah. Um, and notably, compared to, on HMDB, we even surpassed supervised pre-training. And we actually tried pretty hard to improve the supervised baseline. So this was an apples to apples comparison, as you can find in the paper. All right, next, we're going to talk about analyzing bias in NLP, natural language processing models. So why does a computer vision researcher walk on this? Um, well, for me, there were two reasons. A, I had the amazing opportunity to work with a bright and really open-minded team of interdisciplinary students on this project, which is really something no one should say no to. And B, I believe that thinking about bias from a different yet still quantitative perspective is very important if we want to become unstuck at this current situation and arrive at actual solutions. The paper is called Bias Out of the Box, an empirical analysis of intersectional occupational biases in popular generative language models. It was presented at NeurIPS 2021, and these are the authors, and we were um, a team of the Oxford uh, AI Society. And yes, we could not find a longer title. Before I start talking about what we did and what we found, I want to start at this title and unpick some of its elements. Out of the box, open source libraries like Hugging Face make large scale language models readily available and easily usable, but not all practitioners will carefully select which models they use and how parameters are set. Making these models so readily available is great for research and encourages downstream applications from companies or startups, but it also means they will in some scenarios be applied directly out of the box, just use them. This is why we focus on popular models as proxied by Hugging Face downloads. In the main paper, we analyzed GPT-2, but we also confirmed similar results apply for XLNet, the second most downloaded model. The next focus is on robust empirical analysis. It seems stereotypical and bad that women are predicted to be babysitters and men computer programmers, but we need to be aware of our own biases as researchers interpreting ad hoc results. So while previous literature has analyzed sentence completions directly, we instead use a Monte Carlo approach, generating nearly 400,000 sentence completions, then analyzing the stati statistic distributions return. GPT-2 is a black box, but this method allows us to inspect the hood under the hood to approximate GPT-2's prob probabilistic priors over how it associates different groups of people with different jobs. Additionally, additionally we compare this artificially generated distribution to the ground truth distribution of the US labor market. Third, intersectional biases are a necessary consideration because a single axis of analysis treating gender and race as mutually exclusive categories this distorts the reality of marginalized communities, such as Black and women. Finally, why this particular topic? Well, AI-assisted tools are being used in industry. When Harvard Business Review writes on it, Forbes writes on it, CNBC are writing about it, surely there must have been plenty of research done on the biases of these models, right? Right? <laughs> well, no. We of course don't have access to their models, but it's very likely that people just use these models out of academic research and use this as a base for developing products. So in this case, research really needs to catch up. So here we analyze NLP models like those of uh, web scale trained GPT-2, which are increasingly being used for all kinds of tasks with regards to this specific topic. So our paper makes three main contributions. We analyze the most downloaded text generation models applied out of the box, investigate understudied bias of varied intersections with gender, and we benchmark the extent of bias relative to inherently skewed societal distributions of occupational associations for which we use the US data as a benchmark. How do we collect our data? We prompt GPT-2 using prefix templates like those shown here. Specifically, we use two prefix templates. First, an identity-based template, which intersects gender with four identity categories. Now, 
We are aware of the limitations of this binary treatment of gender and discuss extensions in our appendix. Secondly, we have a namespace template of names sampled from the most popular male and female first names per continent as obtained from Wikipedia. While the identity template tests the explicit prompting of GPT-2 with an intersectional identity, the name, names template tests more implicit forms of bias. So what biases does GPT-2 ha have in the context of occupational biases? Well, the first finding is one of occupational clustering. While 16 jobs account for 50% of the outputs for men, only eight jobs account for the same share for women. Similarly, at the 90% level, men are associated with more jobs than women, 66 versus 43 respectively. This suggests that GPT-2 predicts a wider variety of jobs for men and a narrow set of jobs for women. Comparing the Gini coefficients for gender intersection pairs also confirms a greater clustering of women into fewer jobs across all intersections, especially for sexuality and religion. We run 262 logistic regression models to confirm that the inclusion of a woman dummy variable and intersectional interaction effects changes the likelihood of job associations. We also found that the occupations predicted by GPT-2 for each gender seem stereotypical. Men are associated with manual jobs such as laborer, plumber, truck driver, and mechanic, and with professional jobs such as prof software engineer, developer, and private investigator. Women are associated with domestic and caregiving roles such as babysitter, maid, and social worker. Notably, 90% of the returns for prostitute were women, and over 90% of the returns for software engineer were men. We only find three jobs for which GPT-2's outputs suggest a gender-neutral prior over occupations, which are writer, reporter, and sales representative. We next asked, what is the overrepresentation of women in jobs for each intersection? Jobs lie on the dotted line at the first plot if adding intersections has no effect on the gender ratio. Here you can see the results for the religious intersection from the and the identity template, um, which has the greatest male-female dispersion to the equi-proportion line, the dotted line, and results for the continental name origin uh, template, which has the least dispersion. As you can see, the lines, the points are around the uh, dotted line. These findings suggest that name origin has less of an effect on the token returned by GPT-2 than when adding an explicit categorical intersection like ethnicity or religion. We did this with further intersection and you can find the analysis in the paper, but let's go back to the original question. Is GPT-2 biased? Well, the problem is that societal distributions are not truly equal across gender intersection pairs. There is unfortunately unequal representation in the real world job market. So we cannot quantify the extent of occupational bias from the model without considering real world bias. Critically, what we need to know is whether GPT-2 under predicts, matches, or over predicts the degree of societal skew. So instead of asking this question, we can alternatively reframe our anal analysis as relative to the ground truth data. To make this comparison, we match the predicted jobs returned by GPT-2 to categories in the publicly available US labor market statistics. We then compare the predicted distributions to real world proportions. We use mean squared error and Kendall Tau to quantify the discrepancy between GPT-2 and the US data. It's important to be transparent about the limitations of this approach. The US data only reports breakdowns by gender and ethnicity, and there's insufficient data elsewhere to compare the other intersections, such as religion or sexual orientations. Additionally, these are official statistics with set job classification codes, so they exclude job, jobs in the informal sector like babysitter or prostitution. Lastly, this is a very US-centric approach. We want this approach to be a starting point to encourage researchers to benchmark language models bias against the real world, but it needs to be extended for more intersections in more countries. In our comparison to US data, we ask the question, for a given job, how well does GPT-2 predict the gender ethnicity split? This would be taking all the predictions for one job, like CEO, and seeing what percentage of CEOs in the US identify as different gender or ethnic groups. We find 
that most predicted values for GPT-2 do lie close to the ground, tr ground truth, as shown in the figure by the dotted line, the diagonal. Generally, GPT-2 quite closely reflects the extent of societal skew. The Loam MSE and Kendall Tower confirm this result. If we take a deeper look into this and compare GPT-2 predictions with US predictions, uh, with US data, we see that the extreme that at the extremes of the distribution, GPT-2 actually underestimates the extent of societal skew. That is, GPT-2 predicts less women to be assistants, housekeepers, or teachers than work in those professions in the US. Similarly, GPT-2 thinks there are more women working as carpenters, police officers, and mechanics than there are in reality, which is quite interesting. So what are the key takeaways? In our paper, we used a method of prompt engineering to analyze the return job distributions predicted by GPT-2 as compared to the real world distributions. Our key finding is that jobs are less diverse and more stereotypical for women. <clears throat> and this effect is enhanced for intersections. Critically, in terms of bias, GPT-2 reflects a societal skew in the US and in some cases under predicts the extent of occupational segregation by gender. But it does over predict occupational clustering. Let me finish with a visual recap of this talk. We talked about a method that can automatically cluster images into pseudo labels and at the same time learn strong uh, representations um, whose method is being used in current state of the art SSL methods. Then we talked about looking at the uh, ingredient side of self supervised learning. We talked about replacing ImageNet as a pre training data set with a data set that does not include humans and actually works similarly well. Then we looked at multimodal learning, where we have shown that actually clustering a multimodal data set is somewhat untrivial and needs some fixes, uh, but can be done quite easily and is different from learning good features. Then we talked about a feature learning method based on, based on contrastive learning, which allows one to explore different learning hypotheses and which yields state of the art performance. And finally, we um, took a look into one of the largest or most popular generative NLP models and analyzed bias with regards to intersections and occupations. And that is it. Thank you for listening. Um, I know we'll clap for everyone. <laughs> yes. um, thank you very much for uh, the nice uh, presentation. Um, whoever wants to uh, make a question, please uh, type plus one in the chat box. Uh, and I perhaps you can start with uh, one. So I, I believe uh, the bias and privacy and everything is one of the most important, uh, well, or at least one of the most popular uh, uh, um, you know, trends um, in the last few years. Um, so we can expect that it's going to be booming. In your opinion, what is the <clears throat> next step or what is the next, um, uh, you know, most important question to be? addressed? That's a difficult one. Um, as you say, it's, it's, I wouldn't call it booming just yet, actually. We're sort of only realizing how we as like engineers and computer vision researchers can, can sort of be more active in this domain. There, there's been many ethics and AI researchers which have pointed out all, all the problems which have been known. But now it's basically our turn to, to implement this and actually use the right data sets, create the right data sets, and not use legacy data sets anymore. So as, as Chitendra Malik has said, like we were in the Wild West until now. Now we need to grow up and actually do the right thing. Um, and there's been many approaches where data sets are being collected in much better ways with consent and actual respecting GDPR, et cetera. So that's great. Um, I think. Apart from replacing legacy data sets, it's important to think about what is the minimal amount of, um, of privacy risk that you need for a certain task. For example, here we've shown that for self-supervised learning, you don't need humans. Um, surely if, if it's about post-detection, you might need humans, sure, but you probably don't need faces. Um, I think doing this in a systematic way and uh, and really getting the field to, to, to a minimum basis of privacy infringing or pri potentially 
uh, private data is, is a step forward. Uh, right. Uh, well, thank you. I, I, I agree very much uh, on all this. Uh, there was a question whether there's going to be uh, whether the recording can be available afterward. Uh, yes, uh, it will be in the uh, YouTube channel of the Kuva uh, seminars, the division seminars. Um, are there any other questions from uh, the audience? I can see one question here that was just ah, Pascal has a question. Pascal, oh, okay. please uh, unmute your microphone and uh, go ahead. Hi, Yuki. Thank you for your talk. Uh, very interesting to see these patterns coming up in GTP2. Uh, this is a, also a quickly going field, uh, learning from large scale textual sources. What is your expectation of the difference between these, these census data and things like GPT-3 or whatever future thing will come? Will they uh, perpetuate certain things or will they solve or address certain things by going even more towards a bigger scale? Um, I mean, we're definitely seeing we're going towards larger and larger scales. I mean, compared to GPT-2, GPT-3 has a ton more data <laughs> and, and this is not stopping, right? I mean, that's why it's also important for us vision researchers. Clip, Align, Philip, they all use like these huge video uh, image text models which have these biases. The internet isn't the world. Um, and some of the papers do write about the biases contained in the models. Some other papers completely ignore the fact, probably for political reasons. Um, I think as researchers in academia, we need to tackle this straight on and actually analyze these, even if we cannot train them. Um, I think this is, this is still using, uh, uh, yeah, adding positive value to the world by analyzing these. Um, if no one else is doing that. And these models, sure, they're research, but um, yeah, they do get deployed, I think. And the applications that people have come up with from Clip, like drawing images or whatever, sure, there's mostly toy applications, but still, we, we don't know enough, I think, about lots of these models. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, so I see two more uh, questions. Um, and then we can uh, wrap up uh, also with a small announcement on my side. So uh, Itamar asks whether you can share some recommendations for future research areas in self-supervised learning, specifically for computer vision. Recommendations for future research. Um, I don't know. I mean, it depends a bit whether you're at industry or not. <laughs> Like in SSL, lots of the stuff now requires lots of compute. Um, as I've done a bit in my work, I think it's not just about representations, but instead thinking about what can you do without labels in, in the broadest sense of self-supervised learning. It's not about representations. It could be pseudo labeling or detecting objects or all kinds of things you can do and which have been shown to, to be able to do with methods that don't require uh, labels. So I would suggest like thinking and looking more broadly into things or like questioning the fact whether in certain domains we actually do need data out where do, do we really need labels? Do we really need data um, in these domains and just tackling it this way? Uh, thanks. Uh, I hope uh, uh, the question was uh, uh, answered for uh, um, uh, Itamar, uh, I see we've got one more question from Martin and one from Mohammed. So Martin, maybe you can unmute. Yes, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, hello, Yuki. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, I'll be quick about my question. It's about the comparisons with the supervised methods. So it's very impressive to see these, you know, performances of these unsupervised methods uh, encroach on the on the on the supervised numbers. Uh, I wonder if you can say something about um, this type of comparison. Uh, I, I wonder if I may ask a critical question: Is this a fair comparison, in the sense that for a supervised model, you know, the labels have interpretations for us? Um, whereas the unsupervised or self-supervised, they do a type of discovery. Um, it may seem obvious for us on ImageNet, you know, if uh, self-supervised learns to cluster zebras, that we know it's about zebras. 
but uh, I also work with data sets that have no clear interpretation at all. And, and I wonder, you know, if I apply these self-supervised methods on this type of data um, and I get out clusters, I, I am still faced with a non-trivial problem of, of interpretation. So my question is really like, okay, are, are these two methods solving the same task? And if they are not, is the comparison in some sense fair? Um, it's a good question. It really depends on the specifics of the task. I mean, for example, in, in one of our papers, we do self-supervised clustering. And then we actually show that if you then just take one image per cluster or five images per cluster, and get the labels for these and just propagate this, this label to the whole of the cluster, you get pretty decent results. So you can think of it as a way to do labeling a lot more cheaper. And in fact, instead of looking at 1 million, image, uh, 1 million images, looking at just a thousand images, one per cluster, makes it a lot easier for humans to interpret as well. And in most cases, what we compare with self-supervised learning and supervised learning, other representations. So if you train on ImageNet supervisedly, take this model and then apply it to some data set where you have not much, like Pascal, for example, detection, which of these works better if you train supervisedly or self-supervisedly. And then it seems that self-supervised representations have now taken the upper hand, likely because they don't throw away as much information as the supervised me methods. Um, and this has been shown for multiple things. Apart from very fine-grained classification, there we're still seeing that ImageNet pre-training is pretty good, uh, supervised training. Excellent, I understand, thank you. Thank you very much. And one last quick question by Mohammed. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the very interesting talk. Uh, I had a specific question about the work on uh, the GDTs. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned, uh, you looked at whether it was better in general to enforce invariance or distinctiveness for different transformations. And I'm, I was wondering, uh, if I'm not misreading the paper, I think the data sets you used had labels, and I was wondering if you made like a more fine-grained comparison on the class level, whether uh, to learn data for certain classes invariance might be better in the one case or distinctiveness in the other yeah uh, that's a really good point um we followed common practice and used kinetics 400 for pre-training you were like we didn't analyze it per label and we only used one data set for pre-training basically um, and then a larger one but for example in something something um, which is another video data set there's a difference between putting an object from left to right and putting an object right to left so in, if you learn invariance of uh, time against here, you, you would be confusing these two classes. So it really depends on what you're after. And we did in the downstream task we were tackling in this paper were um, action recognition. And for this, it seems that, yeah, this analysis was enough, but it, re it will depend on your downstream task, whether invariance is good or not. There's a similar paper in the vision domain as well, where for example, if you apply color jittering during training, you won't be as good as in recognizing exact colors anymore. So you won't be as good at uh, in recognizing specific kinds of flowers, for example, anymore. So this the same holds true for ours as well. Thanks. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, our time is up and I, I'm just going to close with a quick announcement. So 